primarily about what's been happening the last three years, which is being the animator for the Center for the Less Good Idea. And just to reflect uh, with you on the kind of um, balance that I've been drawing into my life uh, in this role as opposed to my life as an artist in my own studio. So it was January 2016, um, early January 2016, and I got a phone call from William Kentridge. Um, I didn't know him very well. I had interviewed him, I think, five years before that for the film and book that I was working on. Um, and he asked me if I'd come and see him the next day in his studio, um, which I agreed to. But he gave me very little context. So when I woke up the next morning, I kind of had the sense that I'd been called into the principal's office. And um, I was quite anxious. Um, but when I got there, I was immediately intrigued. Uh, he very casually told me that that December before, while on holiday with family, he'd come to the sort of recognition um, that he had both the capacity in, in finances and resource, but also the desire to start a center of some sort, a foundation. And he said key things in this first meeting, which were uh, what we began to build this idea on. Um, he said that it needed to be an interdisciplinary collaborative space. It needed to be a space that um, preferenced the collective and the ensemble over the individual. And it needed to afford other artists across the artistic disciplines the kind of opportunities that he's had in his career, which is to play to work truly in an interdisciplinary way, and to experiment and sometimes fail. Um, and that, that was the sort of environment he was wanting to create. He didn't know exactly how, um, but those were, those were his beginning words, and he asked me if I would work on it with him. And of course, I did. <laughs> um, it, um, it, it was an incredible journey because it was one that drew me into William's studio himself, where I began to understand how this man creates the work that he creates, the kind of workshopping processes, the fact that what we see at the end of the day as this mass scale opera that travels all around the world starts in a studio, in a dialogue, in a conversation, where there's a kind of a equality um, between the sound technicians, the lighting operators and designers, the vocalists, the dancers, the choreographers, the writers, and William himself. Everybody has a voice in these spaces. And it's identifying the sparks and the beauty that comes out of these conversations, these physical manifestations of what's possible, that the work then grows and develops. William very seldom starts with a script or with a written idea. He starts with a kind of collective communing. Um, and at the end, the score is written and the script is finalized, not in the beginning. Um, so that was the inspiration for how we would begin to create new work at the center. And um, I began a kind of process of going throughout the city looking for a building. We both had quite a strong vision in our minds as to what the center would look like physically, the brick and mortar of it. And every week we would meet at a new building that was available for sale and we'd walk around it and, and talk about what the space was going to be and the, how this building didn't quite hold that space. Um, and after about, I think, 30 weeks and site visits, um, we started to realize that the actual physicality of the space was less important. There was something about the idea and the concept. And we kept talking about the freedom to be in your process as an artist. Um, the freedom to experiment, the freedom to fail, the freedom to try and try again. And, um, and I was coming up with dreadful uh, titles for the, I think one of them was Fail Safe, sounds like an insurance company or a tiny company. And, um, and in one of these walking uh, walks around a, a kind of a construction site that was uh, being developed, William said to me, do you know the Tswana proverb, um, if the good doctor can't cure you, find the less good doctor. 
and um, we just immediately sort of stopped and looked at one another. William was interested in this less good doctor, this less good idea, the secondary processes, um, and we decided it was going to be the centre for the less good idea. And in fact, the space was not as significant as the drive to begin. Um, and so we chose a very small, modest space, uh, just because of its proximity to William's studio, to being close to him as a kind of mentor in this process seemed more significant than finding a kind of big, beautiful building that we would launch from, uh, where we would be able to use all the resources to rather pay artists to be in the space making um, than to resource it with all the equipment we might anticipate at one day needing. Uh, and so that's, that was the beginning. Um, we, we started with the first season then in early 2017. And we decided during this process of conceptualizing that a space like this doesn't need a director. It doesn't need a permanent curator. It doesn't need somebody who has their own pluck and vision to drive it for as long as they want to. It needs an animator. It needs somebody who can till the ground, make it fertile, help artists break the habit of writing proposals and reports versus being in their process. Um, and so that's what we called my role um, and decided that on a six monthly basis we would build seasons. And at the beginning of these seasons we would invite core curatorial individuals to develop and build the season collectively. These are individuals who are established and recognized and astonishing in their careers, um, but who have been boxed in a lot of ways, who've shown a desire and a capacity to work outside of their discipline and in the collective, but often because of their success um, or because of the demands, uh, often the financial demands of their career, they're stuck in a, in a particular role. So for the first season, we selected Gregory Magnoma choreographer, dancer, Lebo Khan Mishile, writer, poet, and Dominic Gumedi, theatre practitioner, director. Um, and we asked them to sit around a table with us and to begin to think with us as to what this inaugural season would look like. It started with the five of us around a table. By the time we launched the season six months later, there were 90 artists involved and we produced an enormous amount. Um, we've just completed our fourth season and we're cooking on our fifth season now. But what I wanted to show you was how we launched the first season, which was a kind of lecture performance by William that we called the defense of the less good idea, a way of establishing our kind of philosophies. And, um, so I press again to play. So this is just an extract, it's a minute. All of our performances and everything we've ever done is available on our website. And then once you're in the website, you can click into our Vimeo page to see the full performances. So we always create a kind of minute extract to make things bite-sized. Now there comes a battle between the first starting idea, which, let it be said, is a good idea, maybe even an excellent idea. A great big light bulb of an idea. The fragment we glimpsed at the edge of the work is just a brief flaring of a match. Foots. There's a battle between this big lamp and the trace of the match. But often we have to put out the big lamp and follow the trace of that match. What is a fragment at the periphery comes to the center. The less good idea is invited in. Doubt, not knowing, uncertainty are given a safe space. There is a need to drown out thoughts to let another thinking take place. So defend the life-saving unnecessary. Something that um, William also always says is, let us for once strive not to be right. And um, that has been such a valuable kind of philosophy for us to work with at the center. Um, and it's been such an incredible privilege to build a space, to build an organization uh, in the same way that you build an artwork. To begin with a fragment, to start with an idea, to bring that idea into a space, 
to realize that it starts to crack and collapse because what was in your mind and now what's in the space as it meets the other elements in the space is not what, what you envisioned. And to hold that crack, to sit in the sticky stuff and to say, okay, so what is interesting about the collapse? What's interesting about the fissures and the cracks that are emerging out of trying to make a space? Um, and you know, we I think we're truly uh, privileged in in the making of the centre is that we don't inherit any of the typical bureaucracy and administration that other organisations do. The only person we report to is an artist who is as mad as a bag of cats. So it's it's been an incredible journey to see how a rigorous art making space can be made without the officious nature that so many of the organizations that are, are trying to teach and trying to make work um, have to deal with on a daily basis. So we're, we're in the momentum that we have is, I think, um, due to the lack of hurdles that we've had to jump, and those are, are typically bureaucratic and structural hurdles that we assume are necessary um, and in fact might not be. Um, so this is this is often how we start a, a workshop. We, we sit in the round, everybody is present um, and we begin with a small kind of talk by William, an inspiration, a, a mentoring uh, a start and then um, each individual has their own kind of voice to add and we begin, we do very little sitting and round, um, table talk, we do much more physical work, um, bringing the body, the voice, the performance into the space. In our first season, um, we decided that our stage would be a boxing ring. Not any boxing ring, um, the boxing ring from the Hillbrow Boxing Club just up the road, neighbor to where we are in city and suburban, also known as Maboneng. And um, this, is, this is the boxing ring that is literally kind of drenched with the blood, sweat and tears of fighters from up the road. And so it has a kind of potency to it. And we didn't just have the boxing ring present, we asked George Corsi, the coach, as well as a lot of his fighters, some of whom are female South African champs, um, to join us for the full season. So we started every single day with a warm-up session led by George, and then the artists drew inspiration from the art of boxing. In that they were, this is the Ntswana Dance Company, choreographed by Cyril Pesa over there. This was the generation of a piece called Bag Beatings. Um, which really drew on the kind of movement um, of boxing and the, and the act of um, the, the, the dynamics between bodies in the ring, um, as opposed to a kind of original composition and percussion based here between Sumpiwe, who's a champ um, boxer, and Dan Saltzik, trombonist, a kind of new score that was created um, in response to one another. Um, and there we have uh, Lebo Khan Mishile and Anne Messina dealing with a kind of metaphor of the fight and the female body and um, generating a piece called Venus Hottentot um, which has gone on to become all kinds of um, different things and have a very uh, full life of its own as a piece. So um, it, it's placing there a kind of provocative thing to respond to in the beginning of the season that generates new possibilities for work. A lot of the work that was made for the ring no longer gets performed in a ring, naturally, but it was, it was giving that very simple thing to respond to, and out of which I think we generated 15 new works. It's, uh, as I said, this, this incredible kind of um, fullness of an environment where we are in a constant debate and a dialogue where we're all present for each other and where a lot of the time the, the workshops can be described as overwhelming and chaotic. Um, and that chaos is often very uncomfortable. Um, and particularly for somebody like myself who's 
in fact, naturally very ordered. If you look at me in my own studio environment, it's one of solitude, it's one of meditation, it's one of control and um, repetition. And that has, that has been the kind of characteristic of my own solitary practice as an artist. To be pulled into an environment like this is fascinating, but it also helps me recognize why in my own studio I'm often looking to create the collapse, to, to build the grid, to have the structure in place so that I might recognize the moment that I can allow for the happy accident and for, and for the collapse. And the kind of um, work that we're doing at the center is about holding the collapse. So, um, and, and being with one another in that collapse and seeing how um, through a kind of physical dialogue we can begin to create alternative languages and alternative ways of thinking as artists that might resonate broader into our communities and societies. The center responds very specifically to some conditions that we feel exist. This is a global situation, but it's, it's quite heightened in South Africa. As an artist of any discipline, if you are applying to the National Arts Council or any kind of institutional grant funding space, you often have to literally tick the demographics of people you will be positively affecting in the time you are making your project. So we're saying that's the cart before the horse. That's illustrating that we don't trust that art is good for society. We don't trust that creative thinking is significant. We're saying that in order to validate yourself as an artist, you need to be on the streets or in the schools doing social work whilst conceptualizing and making your own work. It's too heavy a burden for many artists. If the project is born out of an interaction on the streets or in public space that is the core of the piece, that's fabulous and that work, that work needs to exist and be celebrated. But not all art is born that way. And we need to trust that artists doing odd nonsense things are also good for us. They're necessary. They're shaping and shifting ideologies that need to be shaped and shifted. And um, so it's it's um, it's to say, how do we create a space that illustrates the power of holding the artist, of being a mirror to them, of helping them manifest their work? so that it might stand outside of themselves and be evidence of why we need creative cultural thinkers and provocateurs in our communities. So this is just a little minute that illustrates a very typical workshop. We did for season one and what we've decided to do for season two is to invite a number of curators from different disciplines, people who are deeply immersed in their own practice but have also shown this capacity to work in a kind of sideways way, drawing other disciplines and um, individuals towards themselves. Was, uh, that was just for season um, two, the little kind of video portraits that we create with each uh, individual in the space, but it gives you an idea of the kind of activity that the center holds. And as I was saying, that activity juxtaposed with the other half of my life when I'm pretty much alone in studio and in a, in a very different solitary space, starts to create a very interesting balance for me and one that's been challenging but one that I've started to really work at integrating. So, um, you know, as I said, my work is, is slow and repetitive. It requires um, a stillness um, to, to get to the spaces that I'm wanting to get to. And symmetry um, and balance have always been an aesthetic appealing thing for me so 
um, often looking at that which exists um, in the in the world um, and and in a kind of found way and seeing how I can manipulate it both by drawing in moments the symmetry out and also by identifying the chaos and the disorder and how I might pull that out. So in this instance, um, these are little origami birds that I fold individually out of a set of encyclopedia that my mom and dad bought when they were pregnant with me and my mom was expecting me and, um, and they, it was this kind of investment into my education. And in 2010, they were gonna, I, I came home to visit um, and I saw them stacked up in the garage, ready to be turfed. Um, and I said to my mom, why, why are you throwing this, these away? And she said, well, because they, they were how I had done my projects um, through school. And she said, well, I saw a documentary on BBC and they're no longer printing Encyclopedia Britannica because, or any encyclopedias because it's redundant now, everything's online, so we don't need it in our home either. Um, and so I rescued them and put them in the back of my car and have had them with me and slowly but surely, page by page, I've been folding them and, and manipulating them and finding a way of having the information and the material present but non-accessible and starting to create a series of works that um, talk about this kind of lost, redundant material but in a, in a different way. Um, and in my own way. And so this piece is called Without, Do Without the Dark There Is No Light. And it's about that kind of balance. The surface area that's covered by the gold leaf is the exact same size as the surface area covered by the, the origami. And it's, this is a work that's been living with me for probably five years in the making. Um, and so when I juxtapose these processes with the processes that I go through at the center, they're the antithesis of one another but they also become the mirror of each other. And that's, that's been very interesting. It's, and times it's felt like a complete crisis, like I, from an energy perspective. I thought, I, I don't know how to hold this. I don't know how to hold my stillness and the, and the busyness of the center and of all the other artists we're involved with. But there are moments when I drop down into a kind of crystallized mo a kind of version of, of myself and realize that this is real beauty that's been made here in both spaces. Um, so that constant kind of identifying of those objects and those symmetries that exist in the world, that mirror ourselves and each other, um, the natural orders and chaos um, that are there that, that need to be recognized and held um, have been uh, very exciting. And so Ross mentioned the, the residency that I did in, in 2016, where um, I was invited to Vienna by the Fredel Transfery, and I asked them if they'd introduced me to the Natural History Museum. And in that instance, I had the desire to be with the preparations department, wanting to understand how natural organic material is preserved for the durations that it's preserved for, and the ways in which bodies are cleaned. So they gave me a, a course over a couple of weeks and in this instance um, I was able to prepare an owl, a barn owl that had been donated. Um, and I learned that in the Natural History Museum in Vienna, which is one of the oldest in the world, they still use one of the original methodologies for cleaning skeletons. So in order to have a stable, clean skeleton that will no longer decompose, they don't use what a lot of other museums use, which is kind of chemical processing. They have colonies of hide beetles sitting in the basement. Um, some of these colonies they have not had to replenish for over 50 years. So it's one colony that just keeps replenishing itself. They place a prepared kind of body of an animal in that. And over um, sometimes a period of, of just kind of seven days, the hide beetles strip the skeleton, including suck the calcium from the bones and leave the bones in a completely stable state. And um, what's fascinating is that this is the only methodology we have um, in museum and university practice that leaves the DNA information 100% intact. 
So even though it's our oldest methodology for cleaning, it's, uh, it's the most successful. And so I, um, obviously the, the museum uh, people, the biologists, they found me very strange because they couldn't get me out of this environment. Um, but I asked if I could make a film about it, and I, I set it up uh, over a week and took a photograph once a minute, um, watching the process of, of the owl. I then came home with that footage and turned it into a film and began to compose music uh, based on laments. Um, and together with Mklankla, Maklangu, and Molisila Bongwana, we created a, a composition that I then pulled backwards. So it was it's a very ordered kind of hymn type lament that I then um, brought a kind of backward inside outness to. And so I'm just gonna play you a little bit of what the final film looks like. I wanted to show you then the last season that we had, again, just a minute extract to give you a sense of what happened, but the fourth season happened in October last year. And in this case, we had, we didn't decide on a, on a particular stage as a provocation. We decided to ask Jane Taylor, as a sort of celebrated South African academic, 
um, to create a collapsed conference. So we said to her, use the mechanisms and the structures of a typical academic conference, the reasons why uh, any institution would create a, a conference on a particular topic. And if the topic was going to be performativity, then let's collapse the conference. Let's say that the artists are not allowed to present a paper or a slide presentation or write anything. They have to perform their ideas. Um, we identified a number of works that felt like lecture performances that collapsed the structures of a particular conference. And then there were um, a lot of new works that, that sought to do this. Um, everything, as I said, is watchable online, but I think by the end of that season, that collapsing of the conference was a very solid evidence for us as to what we can achieve as a collective in an organization that doesn't hold um, a kind of uh, bureaucratic, organizational, structural um, system uh, as its truth, where, where we're not interested in that. We're interested in what happens when we do away with that. What's been fascinating for us about the end of this is Dave Mann's actually in the audience somewhere, and he was our resident fly on the wall writer who, who reflected on a lot of the pieces post them having happened. But subsequently, after this conference, we've been invited by uh, Paris 8, the university in Paris, um, to create a journal um, article about the collapsed conference itself. And so the academic institutions are now interested in this as a topic and are really seeing how practice-led um, research has a space, um, both in their worlds and outside of it. And it feels like the right way around. Um, you know, I think for the, for the longest time, universities have been trying to establish interdisciplinary practice. They've been trying to create practice-led opportunities and a lot of the time really struggling with it. But it's, I think, important for us to remove ourselves sometimes from the structure and the institution into a space of making so that we can go back to it with tangible manifest evidence of what it means to be um, holding process rather than um, the project. My question is around um, the whole notion of uh, uh, cross or inter interdisciplinarity in that um, when it's done well, I mean, as I think you guys are doing, it seems to work, but when, when it's done for, the, for, for its own sake, yeah. you know, and I've seen certain instances where artists will just come together and just, but then it doesn't really so How have you navigated that if you've had to, and yeah. what would your comment around that be? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think. There has to be a reason for it. You, you know, you need to be trying to find what the stuff between the two disciplines might look like. And one of the things I noticed is in our second, no, in our third season, we we specifically focused on the digital. Um, and this was because, you know, I I am married to a digital artist, and I've been across the world to different electronic and, and digital art conferences and and um, festivals. And a lot of the time, the, the conversations and the papers and the conference environment that's given around it is fascinating. The tech itself blows your mind. Um, but when you look at the work, something is lacking. And I wondered you know, what, why that might be. And I, and I suspect, I might be wrong, that in the case of a collaboration, an interdisciplinary collaboration in the making of the, art, of the artwork, 
you need the creative technologist and the programmer who understands the language um, of the technology, right? And this is somebody who has, who's really been able to both learn that language but also learn how to break it. And it's a very particular way of thinking and working. And then you have the artist. In most cases, or in many cases, the artist treats the technologist like a techie. And they don't, they don't necessarily understand the complexity of what the technologist is doing. The technologist teaches the art, uh, treat, uh, treats the artist like a veneer and thinks, you know, you're just going to make this look good. And when the conversation doesn't go further than that, the work doesn't make you feel. And I think that's an example of, of what, our, what our space is trying to do. It's trying to foster a kind of mutual respect for what we each bring to that project. Um, it's trying to do away with the individual and their ego and saying we all have very necessary egos that we bring to this, that drive us, that give us the impetus to be making. But in this environment, your voice is no more significant than anybody else's. And we go as far as including, from the beginning, everybody in the making. So the man who is operating the sound technology and the lighting has as much of a say in how these things are going to manifest as the award-winning choreographer. Um, because it's about the value that we each bring as an individual to the project. We don't always get it right, um, obviously, but that's, we try to enter the space that way. And in the representation of the center, we're um, adamant that everybody be seen in how we are archiving. So everybody has a, a kind of moment in the visuals, um, in the acknowledgements, in the communication that we're doing with public to say that these are, these are the components that make up the whole versus this kind of um, top down, this is, these are our superstars and everybody else is insignificant. I don't know if you're familiar with the new interfaces for musical expression conference, but a big problem is technology gets obsolete so quickly and moves that you're not building on the work. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? Is that a problem? Is it something we need to address in art? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's always it's a challenge. It's you know from from kind of art film to now the virtual and augmented works that we're making and how it gets translated. I think one of the reasons why, um, personally, if I experience a great painting exhibition versus a kind of virtual exhibition, I'm often, I feel that the time with the medium and the material that artists have had um, adds a kind of nuance and a power that's very difficult to, to see right now in the digital because we don't have enough time with the technology. Um, so it's, it is one of our challenges, but I also think that it, it can be something that we can work beautifully with. In our third season, we had artists making very beautiful reel-to-reel -reel performances and, and loops, and we can work with that redundancy. We can work with those, that dead media, um, and, and new media, and it's, it's all material, and I think it's all very significant from a kind of metaphorical perspective in terms of how it relates to our bodies, and how these things are all tools and extensions of our bodies. Um, you know, we're busy building this uh, virtual reality exhibition at the moment that we're traveling to Holland called the Invisible Exhibition, and it's a series of virtual reality 360 films that we're making. Um, and, we're, and we're also making augmented work within the Tilt Brush, the Google application environment. And I just, I, while we were, you know, um, setting it up and having artists draw within there, um, I put the headset on my six-year-old daughter's um, eyes and I explained to her how she could play with this. And, and she drew and she had fun and she actually explored in ways that a lot of artists are scared to do. Um, and I thought, that was very interesting because she's not as constrained as I am in that environment and she's less fearful of it because she's already exposed in a different way than I am. But when she came out of it and she was describing it to my husband that night, she said, mommy put a pair of goggles on me and then I was inside my brain. And inside my brain I can do things that I can't do when I'm outside my brain. 
And uh, that, that's a very beautiful description of what tech like this is doing. It's extending our brains and our eyes and our bodies. Um, and even as it becomes redundant, I think it's, it's about um, moving and with that, using both, using the redundancy and the newness of it.